Welcome uh, everyone to the Policy Circle Move the Needle program. I think we have people really joining us from all over today. So tell us in uh, the chat where you are uh, coming from today. We'd love to uh, hear from you. You know, let's get, uh, so we have people from Virginia, from Wisconsin, I'm here in Illinois, and we have people from Indiana, so welcome everyone, and we want to get uh, started. You know, all policy circle conversations are grounded in a policy circle brief, and today we're discussing the U.S. Senate, so we will be posting a link to the brief, and we invite you to use that brief to uh, as the basis of conversation with your friends, family, and your circle. You could do that virtually to fully understand, uh, you know, what the, how the Senate functions. So specifically today, our focus is the balance of power and what is at stake in the Georgia Senate runoffs. Um, and, and first, let's start, I, I can't imagine going through another uh, election cycle. So why are there we in a runoff election in Georgia? Well, in Georgia, to be elected in office, the law requires that a candidate wins a majority of votes, 50% plus one. And in November, out of a field of 20 candidates, no Senate candidate won a majority of votes. So that's why there's going to be an election in Georgia on January 5th, uh, 2021. And um, the candidates are um, Republican Senator David Perdue, who is defending his seat against Democratic challenger John Ossoff. And the other election, the other election has candidate Reverend Raphael Warnock, who's challenging Republican Senator Kelly Loeffler. So the outcome of these elections will determine which party controls the U.S. Senate. And currently, Republicans hold a 50 to 48 margin. And if they win one of these two seats, then they retain the majority. And Democrats need to win both runoff elections to control the Senate because in the US, the, because the US vice president is able to cast a vote to uh, in case of a tie. And Vice President elect Kamala Harris would break a tie. So that's the situation. Wanted to kind of get everybody on the same page. Uh, and I would like to get started, get our conversation started with Ashley Davis who is a lead principal at Westfront Strategies, a lobbying firm and she, that she co-founded in 2015. And Ashley served in numerous positions in the White House, uh, including assistant, special assistant to Director of Homeland Security and also Deputy Director of Management and Administration. So thank you, Ashley, for joining us today. Um, it's really a pleasure to have you, so thank you. Thank you for having me, Sylvie. And welcome. So Ashley, I think in order for us to really dive into what's at stake in this runoff, we need to kind of start with the basis. And it'd be great if you could explain the role of the Senate in the legislative branch and in oversights of the federal agencies. You counsel businesses, communities, associations, nonprofits on, on how the impact of government and legislation. So share with us you know, the role of the, of the Senate. Sure, and thank you again for having uh, both Sarah and I. I mean, this is an exciting time. I do think that, as you said at the beginning, that none of us thought that we would still be dealing with the election uh, in the end of December, let alone at the beginning of January. But I really think the importance of the Georgia election and why so much emphasis has been put into this is really the checks and balances of our government. I personally believe that having one party, whether it's Republican or Democrats, they that in control of all three bodies, um, really does um, make a formula for maybe extreme legislation being passed. And so I think the emphasis on having the Senate be controlled um, by the Republicans is something that could be very important in regards to good policy being um, passed in the next two years. As you know, the House is uh, has a very tight majority by the Democrats at this point. It's a couple, two races are still not called, but we're between five and six um, uh, 
um, members, but the thing that's different between the House and the Senate and why the Senate arguably would be, uh, is, is very important, is the House, you only need a supermajority to pass legislation. And so that's, as you mentioned before, in regards to the election, it's a plus one. And so what happens within the House is you have a lot of messaging bills that get passed. So extreme legislation, whether it was cap and trade years ago or defunding Obamacare, whatever it is, um, is usually can be passed by the House um, with the, whichever party's in charge. The difference between the Senate is that you need 60 votes to move a piece of legislation to the floor. And that when you do that, it's called um, a cloture vote. And if you don't have 60 votes, you are not allowed to bring um, anything to the floor, whether you're in the Majority Leader McConnell or it would be Majority Leader Schumer. And so what that does, especially with close margins, is it really makes both Republicans and Democrats really um, have to compromise. And so, um, and, and also that it would make that, um, most likely that the president would change, which would pass the legislation no matter who's in charge. The other thing, which right. what you mentioned was oversight. Um, the House and Senate both have oversight in regards to um, the um, agencies, but if the Republicans or in Mitch McConnell stays a majority leader, the Democrats will not have a strict oversight in the House just because it's part of their own party. So if there's something extreme that's happening in an agency, say the Environmental Protection Agency, it's most likely that the House Democrats being in the same party would not do strict oversight. If you do have another party, like if the Republicans would keep Georgia, it's more likely that the um, the committees in charge of those agencies would hold hearings to kind of hold the opposite party's feet to the fire on certain extreme uh, regulations. So I think right. that's the most important. And and also tell us a little bit like the functioning. You know, uh, when what, if the Senate flips, uh, there's there's this this control of the uh, of the of the major of the the majority i mean the, becomes a leader but also the chairmanship of each of the committees and then those the committees are the ones that decide actually what bills get go to the floor and get voted on right exactly. so exactly. yeah and what and what else is anticipated you know in terms of if the senate flips and there's this one party control like what what else would be is anticipated like what kind of discussions are you having with with your clients uh, in terms of the type of bills that will be what would happen who would who would take on chairmanships of the different committees et cetera well, what happens then yeah, you're exactly right. And, and as you mentioned, if the Democrats do pick up these two Senate seats because uh, Vice President-elect Kamala Harris would be the tiebreaker, the Democrats would be the ones that would get the chairmanships um, of the Senate. And so if that happens, and, and you can, this is uh, information that is widely dispersed by Republicans, the, the committee chairs, because of how Democrats pick their chairs by seniority, um, Senator Bernie Sanders would be the chairman of the budget. Um, Senator Dick Durbin would be the chairman of the Judiciary Committee. Um, there would be uh, several others that would be more progressive in their beliefs. For example, um, Senator Durbin um, was not supportive of, of our two Supreme Court justices that went through um, the last few years. And the Senate does, which is very, very important, the Judiciary Committee, but also um, the Senate are, is the body that in the only body that votes on our judges. And so if the Senate would flip, they would have um, the, the president-elect Biden be nominating the judges, whether we have a Supreme Court judge or not, but the other judges, and then uh, the Democrats would be in control to bring it to the floor and through the Judiciary Committee. And um, I think that you see from a business perspective, which is what, what I would be talking about, which most of my clients, whether they're, they lean left or right, what they're most um, concerned about is the fact that the Democrats are running in Georgia bringing some pretty um, progressive legislation to the floor, such as the Green New Deal, which is the um, 
AOC uh, uh, legislation in regards to environmental policy. Um, that they would obviously get as many judges as they could um, through the committee, that they would, uh, Senator Sanders is saying he would try to um, work on socialized medicine. And um, I, I really do just think when you have the one body in charge as I started out this, that you do have the um, potential of major pieces of legislation, such as those major issues that the, the progressives on the Democrat side are running on, um, having a better chance of actually becoming law. Right. Well, yeah. Thanks for thanks for sharing, and thanks for sharing kind of this how the, the Senate functions and uh, and kind of what would happen. Um, what I'd like to do is talk to uh, Sarah about the voter turnout and what is the mood of the voters in uh, Georgia. So uh, we'll bring kind of Sarah in uh, in focus here. Uh, Sarah is the CEO of Deep Group Analytics, a uh, leading marketing technology company, and also the founder of Resonant insights, a real-time consumer intelligence platform. So Sarah is also a contributor on CNBC, so a real honor uh, to have you here. So thank you, Sarah. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you, Sylvie. So I want to talk about, you know, the, the research that your firm has conducted and on the voters in Georgia. And, and it'd be great if you could give people a better understanding of how to read the polls, how can, how are voters uh, segmented in Georgia and what trends you're observing? Yeah, you know, what we see in, in this runoff election is, is really a lot of the same of the general election in 2020. Um, you know, so the polls are very close. Uh, they show the Republicans with a point or two lead in most cases, but under 50%. So of course we want them to be over that, that magic number uh, for victory. Um, we do see a number of things though in the early vote and absentee votes, which I think, you know, there's some mixed messages coming here. Um, there's some really positive news around the demographics of the individuals who are returning ballots and showing up uh, from an early vote perspective. Um, so on one hand, we see uh, the electorate older and whiter than we did in the general election in 2022, and those voters tend to vote Republican. So that is a positive sign for uh, Senators uh, Perdue and Leffler in terms of the makeup of the electorate. We still see Democrats with an advantage overall in the people who have uh, returned ballots and shown up. But then, of course, there's that election day vote um, that uh, in 2020 came in and was heavily Republican. Uh, in this uh, cycle, Republicans have about a 20 point advantage, this cycle being the actual runoff. Republicans have about a 20 uh, point advantage of the people who potentially would vote yet, election day voters. So I look at all that and I feel positive, but you know, Democrats are ahead in the early vote today. They're ahead in who has returned an absentee ballot today. Um, the, and so this becomes a function of turnout, you know? So who is gonna show up ultimately? What's the pie gonna be? How uh, old is the pie? How racially diverse is the pie? Uh, are Republicans successful in persuading suburban women, which is a is a key thing. Um, and so that is a lot of the same of 2020, really, when you sort of think about how this electorate shaped up and how we ended up in the presidential race and in the Senate races with among the closest elections of all the states. Um, one concern that I have when I think about this from the Republican uh, perspective is that the rural voters seem a little demotivated they tend to be overwhelmingly Republican. Um, and I think that is a group of individuals who are very frustrated with the fact that Donald Trump lost the election. They might feel like their leadership in Georgia has let them down and that uh, there was too much fraud in the state that uh, ultimately the president should have won the state and they're frustrated and they're angry. So the, the question is, do they turn out or do they take it out on Republicans? Uh, so we see we see rural votes sort of underperforming where you would expect them to at this point, only slightly, but in close elections, of course, slight matters. So I think, you know, on balance, we're seeing many of the same trends. 
yeah, Republicans need to persuade suburban women. Yeah, and then so, you know, the people in Georgia that have talked to some people in Georgia, people are bombarded with, uh, with ads, with just every, everything they looked at, and many have a tendency to just tune off. So what do you think is likely to influence the voters at this point? I mean, if they, if the, they, those candidates, none of them got a majority um, during the, uh, the election, what is going to change or what will influence people? Do you think like more new people will vote? Like they, they will change their vote or the people that didn't vote for these four candidates will decide to stay home and not. So how is that playing out? What will influence? It's a, it's a really good question. I think there's sort of three factors I, I look at. The, the first is Republicans need to persuade suburban women and suburban women who may be socially moderate and fiscally conservative are going to look at the makeup of the US Senate and wonder if the left wing of the Democratic Party is really going to represent them in the US Senate. Do they want Chuck Schumer to be the majority leader or do they want to stay the course with Mitch McConnell? Do they want an AOC influenced climate bill or are they more comfortable with the balance of power that you and Ashley just spoke about? I think that's the first sort of influence factor uh, and that you see the candidates messaging that. I think the second is on the, on the rural piece, Republicans have to convince voters who are upset, who are Republicans, that this is not a good idea for a protest vote. You know, we, we, we need to think about a balance of power. We need a Republican Senate. Conversely, on the Democratic side, uh, the Democratic candidates need very strong turnout and performance among African-Americans. So they have to convince African-American voters that changing the Senate and giving Democrats the full balance of power will actually improve their lives. And there's some evidence right now that they have yet to make that connection. Interesting. So that that's a it's a it's a really hard message to communicate. I think for all all both can both candidates. Um, so can you explain? I have one last question for you. Is kind of can you explain what are the primary groups that are active in Georgia? So every all attention of the media is everything is in Georgia. But then there's also a lot of external groups that are playing a role in Georgia. And love to hear from both sides. You know what are the the active uh, what are the active groups there? Yeah, there's so much happening now, and there's so many, uh, some so many parties involved. I mean, the, the main ones, of course, are the Senate committees. So the Georgia Battleground Fund, which is uh, born out of the National Republican Senate Committee, is playing an important role in fundraising and in organizing and activating voters. The Democrats have have something similar on their side. Uh, we see a number of super PACs across different issues. Um, one of the groups that I think uh, can have a real impact, particularly for Senator Luffler, is Winning for Women. It's an organization uh, that played a role in many of the Republican victories uh, here in November. Uh, of course, the Democrats have many established women's organizations from Emily's List to Planned Parenthood. So you're, you're seeing kind of all eyes on Georgia with those groups taking the lead. And so there are really no shortage of opportunities to get involved. And to you know play a role and and either contribute if, if that's something people are inclined to do personally, or even you know do phone calls from afar and write letters to friends and family that that may be living in Georgia and be able to vote in this coming election. All right. Well, you know, thank you, Sarah, for sharing your insights. I think it's particularly interesting the way you analyze the the voters regionally and also like in terms of their belief and their issues and what they're concerned about. So I'd like to have uh, Ashley kind of come back to wrap things up. Uh, and uh, we'd love to, you know, for Ashley to also share uh, something that Georgians and non-Georgians can do uh, to be involved in this runoff election and how they could pay attention to it. So can we, do, are we bringing back Ashley? I am back. You are back, great. Um, so, so Ashley, you know what are you know? Um, Sarah shared you know some insights on what people can do. What else, and and what uh, what else do you think? How can people watch this election and also perhaps engage? Well, I do think, and I and I do one thing. I wanted to uh, 
make everyone remember is that this election is the Tuesday after, you know, all the holiday season. And so we, the one thing that Sarah did mention is turnout is going to be the most important part of this election. And so um, I would say the most important thing that people can do right now is make phone calls if you don't live in Georgia. Um, as Sarah mentioned, to uh, ask people to get out the vote. There are lots of things in place in regards to people picking um, individuals that live in Georgia up to take them to the polls or um, to help them with early voting. But I really think that doing that true grassroots work, especially if you don't live in Georgia, um, uh, is really important. And also, if you do live in Georgia, you can go door to door, you can go out and talk about the importance of the election, you can go and talk about the difference between uh, the two Republican senators and the two Democrat senators. But also, um, as you've seen with the 2020 race, I mean, the amount of money that was spent on races is going is continuing and will continue and so if it's something that you're interested to do in doing as again sarah said i think it's really um it's something that we can i'm sure provide um how to do that and we also can provide how to uh get involved right well thank you i mean i think this is uh it's good to just kind of take the time to uh be able to understand here what's what's at stake and what you can do and how you can uh, you can be involved. So so thank you guys for joining me today on uh, on this call just before the holidays. I really appreciate it, and um, and thank you everyone for participating. So um, and I wish you guys a very happy. Uh, holiday and uh, I want to also thanks our wonderful network partners authentic agility games uh, women's public leadership network and policy and pound cake who participated in uh, in this uh, pro helping us put together this program so happy holidays everyone and we look forward to seeing you in 2021 so thank you <laughs>